everyone. It's announcement time here at the Loma Linda University Church, and we love to just show some highlights of all the many things that are happening here. And this weekend, particularly today, we have quite a bit. A lot's going on. First of all, we're finishing our current sermon series, Anonymous. Pastor Joey is going to be sharing with us today. Looking forward to that. Also, we have a special Sabbath school just today right here in the sanctuary at 1030. It's featuring Dr. David Trim. He's going to be doing the Sabbath school lesson and he's going to be presenting in the DeMazzo Amphitheater at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. He is the director of archives and statistics at the General Conference, but he's also a well-known historian. He's going to be sharing for Sabbath school right here in the sanctuary at 1030. Seniors, don't forget that the Senior Fellowship Lunch is today at 1.30 in the William Loveless Fellowship Hall. Don't forget your dish and come out, enjoy community, good food. And we wanna thank Daryl Ritzer and his team for all they do for our senior ministry. And then tomorrow, we mentioned it last week, the TK Kindergarten Roundup is tomorrow at Loma Linda Academy. There's appointments at 9.15 at 10. This is for the 25-26 school year. If you do attend, the opportunity is there to save some money on registration, but it's a great opportunity to get some information. They would like you to RSVP. So go to our website, louc.org, or you can go to their website and just reserve a time. Every month, our quilters are at it making quilts for the Nick U and Sack Clinic. You don't have to have any experience. Come out Sunday, which is tomorrow, from 9 to 3, and also Monday, 9 to 3. They have good food, and it's just a great way to give back to our community. Many people are wondering what our church is doing to help the hurricane victims back east. Well, here is Linda Mendez, the pastor for our UReach, and she is going to give you information on how you can get involved and help. Good morning, church. Last Sabbath, you heard me announce that we are partnering with Asher Hills Church in efforts to help with the Hurricane Helene. If you would like to donate and participate, we urge you to go to our website, youreachlluc.com. There you'll be able to find a list of the items that we are collecting. We will be collecting all these donations all the way up to November 2nd. So if you would like to donate, please make sure you, you go to our website and see what items are needed and you bring them to our UReach office. If you are unable to donate, no problem. You can help on November 3rd by helping us load the semi that will be leaving the following day. If you'd like more information on that, please call our UReach office. We'll be able to tell you a time and a place on where we will be doing that. For those of you who have already started to donate and bring things, thank you so much. We so appreciate your efforts and we appreciate you being doers of the word. May God continue to bless you. Our next announcement is so important. There are many of you, or you may know someone that has lost someone. Well, there's a special virtual or Zoom seminar next Sabbath at 4 p.m. It's entitled Surviving the Holidays. It's just 90 minutes. It's a Zoom seminar. They do ask you to register, but it's next week at 4 p.m. online. We have some special concerts that are coming up. We want you to mark your calendars. The first one is our annual After Thanksgiving Heritage Singer Concert. That is November the 30th. It will start at 4.30 p.m. doors open 30 minutes ahead of time and then our God with us candlelight concert here at the church uh, that begins at five o'clock mark your calendars tickets will be available very soon now next week at 10 30 in the you reach cafe we're starting a brand new sabbath school it goes for just six weeks it's back to basics this is for new believers or maybe you're someone that just wants to kind of refresh some of those basic concepts about the gospel. We really encourage you to check that out. It starts next week in the UReach Cafe during Sabbath school time at 1030 and it'll go for six weeks. Also next week we're starting a new sermon series, Shabbat Shalom, May You Flourish. Stu, this is all about the Sabbath. For those of us that have grown up with it, we may have some mixed feelings. Yeah. People generally have some kind of quirky rule or something remember as a kid. This is an opportunity for those maybe grew up with it 
to really connect with yeah. why that is so important. And then for those that maybe it's a new concept, it'll also enrich and see how much this contributes to our walk with Jesus each and every day. So I'm really looking forward to this this yeah, particular it's going to be a great series and it's going to go for four weeks. And what we're going to be doing is grow groups during the season. Some of you may want to join a grow group and build community and dig deeper into the word. This is a great time to start because it's four weeks. You can test it out and see if it's even for you. We're going to have groups available on Zoom. So even if you are a member at this church, but you cannot come here, or maybe you're not a member. It's open to whoever just wants to learn more about scripture, about the Sabbath. You can join via Zoom. We're gonna have home groups and also groups here at the church. It is really going to be special. And I encourage you, if you've been thinking about it, don't think any longer, go online, register. You will see a whole bunch. We have a, a 15, I believe, different grow groups that you can sign up for. There are different ages, different locations, different days and times. Select one that fits your schedule. Don't pass up this incredible opportunity. We know there's a lot of craziness going on in the world and this is a great opportunity that maybe you would like to see your spiritual life enhance and grow. This is an incredible opportunity to do that. So we're really encouraging you to take advantage of that. Well, that's our announcements for today. For the latest information, go to our website, LOUC.org. Visitors and guests, it is an honor to have you here today. Please come out to the foyer. We would love to meet you, answer any questions that you might have. We hope that everyone has a terrific Sabbath day. We love you guys.
Good morning, church. I hope if you are able, recently you have had the opportunity to swing on a swing. Swings are magical, they truly are. You all remember the game you would play as a kid. You would sit there on the swing and it would be at the bottom, stationary. And without touching the ground, you'd have the competition to see who could get the swing going the highest and the farthest and the fastest. It's an interesting game, isn't it? As you sit there, you lean back and forward, adding your weight and your energy at precisely the right time. Each little bit that you add, it feels small, but pretty soon it adds up. And before you know it, you're swinging across a great arc with huge amounts of momentum. You can see exactly how much momentum you have when somebody walks in front of the swing and you make contact with them. <laughs> the church is like a force that is moving through time. And every time you add your energy at just the right time and place to this movement, you increase its momentum throughout time and in society. So I just simply want to say to all of you, thank you so much for adding your energy to this movement that we call the church. Whether you have chosen to come here today in person, thank you. Or if you're watching online, thank you so much. If you'd be interested in clicking like and commenting on our services, that adds energy to the power of the church. Whether you are tuning in from prison or leading a small group in South America discussing the Sabbath school after you've listened to Miguel lead you through it, however you participate in church, if at work when somebody says, where does that peace that you have in your heart come from, you simply say, it is because I believe in God, however you do it, you add to this force that moves through society. And that's a powerful thing. So powerful that the scriptures tell us that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So thank you so much. I just want to say welcome to church. I am glad you are here and participating in this. You will have a blessed time, and thank you so much for participating. Before I go, I do want to also just again remind you of what Joel mentioned about our upcoming sermon series and the attending small groups as well. I promise you that will be an absolutely wonderful time to get to know more people in this community. You know how when you get to know somebody, when you go into their house and you see their books and you see their decorations, you see their house, you become good friends with them. Or if you have that chance to discuss spiritual matters online in a Zoom group, however you participate, if you do have the opportunity to participate in these grow groups that are coming up as part of our next sermon series, I promise you will feel closer to each other and closer to God. Thank you so much for joining us with worship. Happy Sabbath.
Let us pray. Father in heaven, you are our story. When we look back in our lives, we can see you. You have proven yourself faithful to us. And that's why we are here to worship you. With our music, with our silence, with our words, with our offerings, we are here to tell you thank you for who you are. It's so beautiful to wake up in the morning knowing that you are there for us, always. So you see us, and you know that we are all struggling with something because this side of eternity, living here, can be sometimes challenging. But we know that you love us and you give us everything we need because you already know pain. Because you came, you walk among us, you die for us, and you can understand and relate to us. Thank you, Jesus, for being our story and our song. And we also want to pray today for the world around us, for the war, for people that are suffering in such levels that we cannot even imagine. Help us to be sensitive. Help us to somehow shine with your light to their lives and show who you are as well. And help us to start with the people that are close to us so we can be patient and mild and compassionate to all the people that are here in this community with us. We love you and we offer you our worship from a humble heart. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. When somebody starts the conversation with, bless her heart, what usually follows? Usually something negative, because you've paid up front, bless her heart, now I'm going to diss her, disrespect her, or say something negative. I know how it works. And also, when somebody says, in full disclosure, what follows is usually the truth or a manipulative way to say, this is what I want you to believe is the truth, right? Correct? Turn to your neighbor and say, in full disclosure. <laughs> See, it feels good, doesn't it? I'm about to be confessional. All right. I'm at the offering call this morning, and in full disclosure, I haven't always been a faithful giver. When Susie and I sat down, <laughs> the rabble back here is causing me great stress, but... In full disclosure, I'm <laughs> happy you're back. In full disclosure, when I got married to my precious wife, we sat down at the table and decided that we would be faithful givers. We would not only give of our tithe, we would make an offering. This was difficult for a young couple who had not been faithful and I won't indict her, but I will indict myself. I was not a faithful giver. When I got married, we promised the Lord that we would pay tithe every week, and we would pay offering every week. Friends, something happened. I wondered where that came from. The Holy Spirit, I knew, rested on my heart and said, Doug, do the right thing. And I responded to the Holy Spirit's calling. And we have been faithful tithe uh, givers, and the Lord has blessed us in ways we cannot possibly estimate. Friends, if you are still on the fence about tithes and offering, give of your heart. The Lord will see it, and he will bless you in ways, in subtle ways that you will never know. We benefit here at this church because you are faithful givers. You pay your tithe, and you give to projects in the church, like music, department, outreach, which is very uh, top priority right now, and also our capital campaign, the new family ministries building. You can see in your bulletin that we have 19.7 uh, million more to go. 
and we're on a good path. Thank you for being faithful in your tithes and offerings. You now have a very important job, and I think you know what it is. The moms and dads and aunties and uncles and grandmas and grandpas are going to wave those dollar bills high up in the air, and it's your job to go out and get them. 
Can you go and do that now, please? Start waving, church family. Start waving. Now, boys and girls, I have seen some disappointed moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas put their dollar bill down because nobody found them. That's one less dollar for the church. Make sure you go and find every one of those waving hands. Thank you. Church, we have another job for you this morning. My junior choir is up here, and we are going to be singing an old Sabbath school favorite, Oh, Fill It Up. Would you mind helping us with the echo, Oh, Fill It Up? You'll know when it's your turn. Come on up. You can sit up here on the steps. It'll, it'll work fine. Come on up, everyone. Come on up. There's plenty of room. There's, there's steps right here. You can sit up there. Right there's a good spot for you. Keep coming. Make sure you bring all the dollar bills. Oh, you look good. I'm going to climb up here with you. Here we go. Let's see if I can only step on one or two. All right. Here we go. There we are. All right. So I usually ask you a, a question when I come to talk with you. And the question I often ask is, what do you think I am dressed as today? Cowboy, you are going to grow up and be important, smart people, but that's the wrong answer. <laughs> An explorer. I like that even better. In addition to these answers, I'm looking for the correct answer. Yes, a missionary. a missionary. Wow, you are going to be a, oh, it's hard, it's hard to make fun of that. <laughs> I can do it, but it's hard. Go ahead. Okay, so here, here is, here is a, a clue. I have, I have one tool I brought with me. What do you think it is? Pliers. They are not pliers. They are? Clippers, yeah, they're clippers. Somebody, I heard it over here. What, yes, what am I? I'm a gardener, that is right now. I first learned that I would be a gardener based on some magical words that my wife said to me. She said these, these, these beautiful words as she was looking out our window. She said, our backyard needs help. I didn't know it was trying to do anything, but apparently, our backyard wanted to be a garden. So I became a gardener. Now, I probably should have put, put, this, put my, my hat on. Then you would have known for sure that, I, that I'm a gardener. I wasn't going to wear my hat today, but one of my daughters said, if you don't wear your hat, you're just some guy in a flannel shirt. So, <laughs> so it's always good to have daughters. They keep dads humble. That's why I have two. So here are some of the things I, I grow in my garden. Look at, look at these. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? I grow flowers. I'm a flower gardener. And this is, this is one that just says, look at me. I'm a flower. It's beautiful, isn't it? Oh, here, here's another one. I, I really like this, this one. Look at how pretty that is. Huh? Look at, look at that. All that detail. Oh, that's, that's, that's just beautiful. I, I, in fact, I even have some trees in my garden because, and they're, they're kind of useless trees. They're, they're called crepe myrtle trees. They're my favorite tree. They grow slow. 
They don't give a lot of shade. You can't eat anything from them, but they have beautiful flowers. In fact, I've planted eight of them in my garden. That's how much I like them. So they, 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 are, they are really good. Now, also in my garden, there, there's a part of my garden that, that most people don't see. In fact, it, it, they don't see it because it's around the side of my house. It, it, it's, it's, it's kind of hidden, and it's next to the fence. And if you were to go look at it, you would probably say, that must be where he grows his in fact, you probably say he doesn't pay any attention to that. It's just a bunch of weeds. In fact, it does look like weeds. They, they don't really have any flowers. It, it's, uh, it, I don't even know if I'd give them names, but I have names. In fact, I gave them names, and I wrote, write them on little tags, and I put them in there. And I, I went out this morning, and I clipped some of them to show to you some of my weeds. Look at this weed. What do you think this weed is called? Basil is right. And it, oh, it smells good too. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, and here's, here's another one. What do you think this one's called? Mint. Yes. You, wow, you, you're pretty smart. I've got to give you harder questions. Oh and, oh, and here's one. This is my favorite one. Wow, so I'm more impressed than I plan to be today. <laughs> this, is, this is rosemary, and, and I thought I was going to get Christmas tree or something like that, but yes, you want to You have a big one? Well, mine was bigger than this before I cut it. Yeah. Oh, and, oh, and here's, now let, let me try some trick questions. Let me try, let, let's try, oh, here's one. This is a hard one. Weed, yeah, it looks like a weed. What do you think this one is? Oregano, how do you? Yes, that is oregano. All right. Okay. Yes, it is parsley and cilantro, you're right. And I was going to try to confuse you because they look a lot, they look a lot this, like each other, I know. Fourth service is going to be great. Or so, so I have these, I have these, these weeds in my, in my side garden that are off to the side, but you know, they, they, are, kind of, they are kind of impressive, and here's, here's why I was really impressed with them, because even though they're, 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 they're on the edge, or sometimes we, we say they're on the margins. Everyone say margins. margins. Yeah, they're, they're, on, they're on the margins, they're on the outside, they're not, they're not the, the center of my garden, what looks really important. They're, they're on the outside, but sometimes the things that are on the outside are really important. And here's how I learned that. Just yesterday, my wife was making lasagna. And she forgot some things from the store. And then she sent me a picture and she said, I forgot some things from the store, including parsley and oregano. But then I remembered, you have a garden out there that's hidden on the side of the house. And she went out, and, and those were the pictures of her taking, taking some of my oregano and parsley to put in her lasagna. So some of these things that we think aren't important turned out to be very important. In fact, all of my weeds, you can eat them all. Anyone want to eat my flower? No. no, you don't want to eat a flower? And I was thinking, you know, in, in the Bible, Jesus tells us that we are the salt of the earth, which means we add some flavor to things. Salt might not seem so important, but when you add it to other things, it makes them important. And this, this sermon series, our pastors have been talking about a, a big word called Anonymous. Everyone say anonymous. anonymous. It's kind of fun to say. It's kind of like oregano. Say oregano. oregano. Anonymous. anonymous. Yeah, anonymous. That's, that's a great word. It's things that we might not think are important, but some of these things that may be anonymous might be on the margins, on the outside, or the edge of the garden are just as important as the beautiful flowers in the middle. 
Thank you for being such good listeners. If you're not part of the children's choir, I invite you to return to your seats. If you are part of the children's choir, you can just stay up here. Good morning again. Did you know that October is Pastor Appreciation Month? It is. And so this morning, we would like to take a moment and just thank those of you, all of you who have participated in pastoral ministry, but especially the pastors who serve here at the Loma Linda University Church. And so the junior choir would like to dedicate this song to them and to all of their energy and love and prayers that they pour into us, their congregation.
The scripture reading in Act 21, 8, 9, New International Version. Living the next day, we reached the Syria and stayed at the house of Philip, the evangelist once of the seven. He had four unmarried daughters who prophes- prophesied. Joel chapter 2, 28 to 29, the day of the Lord. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Thank you, Kea and Leilani. Aren't our children incredible? They are, wow. We've had some, so much amazing music today, thanks to both of our, our choirs for that, those songs and, and that appreciation song. I don't know where they got those photos, Amy Leukert. Um, she must have done a deep dive on social media to get some of those. So how do you know if a word is real? Because words appear all the time, right? Words like hangry. When you're so hungry that you get a little bit angry. Anybody here been hangry before? Yeah? Yeah. Or adorkable. Adorable in sort of a dorky way. (laughs) Adorkable. Yeah. Clearly words that fill an important gap in the English language. But are they real? Could you, for example, use these words in a game of Scrabble to earn a triple word score? (laughs) So I'm curious, how many of you would say that both of these words, can we put them on the screen again? Both of these words are real. How many of you would say that both of these words are real? All right, we have some of you. How many of you would say, no, they are definitely fake, and I'm a little offended that you're even asking? (laughs) <laughs> well, Anne Curzon is an English professor who gave a TED Talk back in 2014 to try to answer that question, what makes words real? And she noted that the English language is constantly changing, constantly evolving, so much so that even the writers of dictionaries, which we often refer to to try to figure out if a word is real, Even the writers of dictionaries are just trying to keep up with popular usage. Just think about how much our language has changed over the years. Way back in 1875, Dean Henry Alford objected to the use of two words that we now consider common. Take a look. He wrote, desirability is a terrible word. Reliable is hardly legitimate. We do not rely a man. We rely upon a man so that reliable does duty for rely uponable. That's a good point, right? Trustworthy conveys all the meaning required. Now, despite Dean Henry Alford's objections, I don't think any of us would have any issue with using either of these two words in any kind of context. See, sometimes, sometimes today's fake words become tomorrow's real words. See, our language continues to change. I mean, even the meanings of words change over time. Words like nice. Nice used to mean silly or simple or foolish. That's what nice used to mean. Hardly the compliment it is now. Silly kind of went the opposite direction. Silly used to mean worthy or blessed. So if someone calls you silly, you can take it as a compliment. (laughs) Awful is another word. Awful used to mean worthy of awe, which is why we have terms like the awful majesty of God, right? It's worthy of awe. See, whether we like it or not, our English language is constantly changing, and so are our lives. In fact, maybe that's the way it's supposed to be, because we follow a God who moves, 
A God who moves us to a better understanding of who he is. A God who moves us to become more and more like him. And yet, over time, what we see in history is God's people often resist that movement. They resist change. They resist it. That's actually why the Jewish leaders during Jesus' time missed the Messiah. It wasn't because they hadn't learned the lessons of the past. It's because they missed how he was moving in the present. See, they, they, had, they had learned the lesson of how to, how to avoid being corrupted by their neighbors. They had learned the lesson of not, how not to worship idols of wood and stone. Those lessons they were comfortable with. But a Messiah who came to save their enemies rather than destroy them, that they weren't ready to accept. And over and over again, we see, we see God's people clinging so tightly to the past that they can't see how God is moving in the present. The children of Israel, they were so afraid of going into the promised land because of the giants there. They actually asked Moses to take them back to Egypt where they were comfortable so they could be slaves again. Zedekiah, King Zedekiah, he was so enamored with his position that he rejected Jeremiah's message to surrender to the Babylonians. Jonah was so comfortable with his hatred of the Ninevites that he refused to go and preach to them. Over and over again, God's people cling so tightly to the past that they're unable to see how God is moving in the present. So how can we avoid making the same mistake? How can we avoid missing where God is leading us next? That's what we're going to seek to discover in today's passage. Because in Acts chapter 21, verses 7 through 9, God reveals something powerful about the way he leads. So turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 21, starting in verse 7. Now, a bit of background about this passage. In this passage, Paul is traveling home. He's been on a missionary journey for three years, and he's finally making his way home. But he makes a stop where the author of Acts, Luke, makes an interesting observation. So take a look. Verse 7. We continued our voyage from Tyre and landed at Ptolemus, where we greeted the brothers and sisters and stayed with them for a day. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. Do you know what I thought, what I wondered when I first read this passage? Why? Why does, why does Luke mention these four unmarried daughters of Philip? I mean, it makes sense that he would mention Philip. Philip is an important character in the book of Acts. He is one of the seven one of the first deacons set aside to care for the community of faith. He was actually also the very first named missionary in the book of Acts. Did you know that? It wasn't Paul. It was Philip. He went to the Samaria and preached with such power and such conviction that many people followed the way, including, including a magician, a famous magician by the name of Simon. And when God needed someone to explain the book of Isaiah to the Ethiopian official, the Holy Spirit sent Philip. So it makes sense that he would mention that, that Paul visited Philip on his way home. But why these daughters? They don't seem to really contribute to the story at all. They don't drive the narrative of Paul's journey home at all. In fact, this is the first time and the only time they're mentioned in the entire New Testament. So why mention them here? I can't be sure. But my guess is that it has something to do with the theme of the book of Acts. You see, we often refer to this book as the Acts of the Apostles. But many have noted that a more accurate name might be the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the main character of the book of Acts. 
The Holy Spirit is the one who calls and empowers and sometimes even physically moves his messengers all around the Roman Empire to spread Christianity. And it's a good thing, too, because the Holy Spirit spreads Christianity to people that those within the community of Christ wouldn't expect. People like the Roman centurion or the Ethiopian eunuch or a persecutor of Christians named Saul. Over and over again, you see the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts expanding the bounds of Christianity to those that in, people inside Christianity would consider outsiders. So maybe, maybe the reason why Luke mentions these four women here is to show another example of God doing exactly that, expanding the bounds of Christianity, showing that these four anonymous women could play an important role in the movement of Christ as well. That's precisely what Bible scholar Ajit Fernando seems to suggest in his commentary on the book of Acts. He writes, In the early church, prophecy was one of the most cherished gifts. But in that culture, unmarried women normally did not have high standing. This may be Luke's way of pointing out that low-status people were included in positions of prominence in the church. Let's unpack that statement for a moment. He starts by writing, in that culture, unmarried women normally did not have high standing. See, these women had three strikes against them. First, they were women. And despite the fact that many rabbis during that time shared of how women had dignity and self-worth, in practical terms, in Jewish society, they were treated much like second-class citizens, which is why many Jewish men would begin their days with a prayer, a prayer that I urge you men not to emulate. They would pray and thank God for not making them a slave, a Gentile, or a woman. So first, they were women. Second, they were unmarried. And again, in that society, a woman's sense of purpose often came from her ability to have children and to raise a family. And so many would have looked at these women and thought to themselves that they hadn't actually begun their life yet. And third, they were young. How young? Well, the actual term that Luke uses here is virgin. And this is what Craig Keener in his background commentary on the New Testament writes about that word. He writes, the point of virgins here is probably that Philip's daughters are young, under the age of 16. Under the age of 16. That includes the oldest daughters. That means the youngest of the four was probably no older than 12. These are hardly experienced women. These are young, inexperienced girls. And yet, and yet, God gifts them with this incredible gift, the gift of prophecy, a gift that Paul refers to as one of the greatest spiritual gifts. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28, he lists prophets only second in position to apostles in the church. He writes, And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. He regards prophecy as a more important gift for the church than teaching, than preaching, come on now, than miraculous healing. In fact, in the book of Acts, Luke seems to make a connection between leadership and prophecy. In the dictionary of the latter New Testament, it writes this about the prophetic gift in the book of Acts. It seems that Luke deliberately draws Christian leaders as prophets. This is often indicated by speaking of such people as full of the Holy Spirit, a continuous state. See, in the book of Acts, being a leader was synonymous with being a prophet. And that makes sense because, again, we said that it was the Holy Spirit that was leading this movement. 
the spread of Christianity. So any human leader needed to make sure that they were aligned with the Holy Spirit. That the ways that they were speaking, the ways that they were acting, that the ways that they were leading were all inspired by the Spirit. And yet the Holy Spirit gives these anonymous young women, women who were as anonymous, as insignificant as you could get in that Jewish society, he grants them this important position to, according to Ajit Fernando, to show that low-status people were included in positions of prominence in the church. Wow. But you know what? This is nothing new. Because God often uses those on the margins to lead those in the middle. Can I say that again? God often uses those on the margins to lead those in the middle. Think about it. When Jesus called his 12 disciples, he didn't draw them from the religious elite. He didn't draw them from among the Pharisees or the teachers of the law, no. He went to the fringes of society and drew them from fishermen, from tax collectors, from zealots. And when you look at the history of God's, of, of, of our world, what you see is that renewal movements in, among God's people are often led by those on the fringes, the young, the poor, the disenfranchised. I mean, even in the Adventist church, when this church was just a brand new movement, the Adventist movement, it was led by a teenage prophet and a bunch of preachers in their 20s. Because God often uses outsiders to lead insiders. And yet, God's people often reject. God's people in the middle often reject his messages that come from the margins. And as a result, they miss what God is doing next. I had the privilege of participating in the Reformation tour last month. And it was incredible learning about all of these, these men and women who had risked their jobs, their reputations, their lives to preach and share these messages that God had entrusted to them. But what was heartbreaking was all the needless violence and pain. All the wars, all the fightings that could have been avoided if those with power had just been willing to listen to those without. And what was even more tragic was that it wasn't just the original institutional leaders of the church who rejected these voices. It was sometimes the reformers themselves, the very reformers who were persecuted for their beliefs, turned around and persecuted others for theirs. So we had the Lutherans who fought against the Zwinglians because they disagreed about the essence of the emblems at communion. And then the Zwinglians turned around and they persecuted the Anabaptists because they disagreed about how to perform baptism. And this pattern continues over and over again throughout history with each group denouncing the next as heretics. So as I examined this pattern, it struck me that sometimes, sometimes, today's heretics become tomorrow's heroes. Stay with me. Sometimes, today's heretics become tomorrow's heroes. Sometimes, not always, sometimes the people we denounce as heretics turn out to be God's heroes. Sometimes the excommunicated monk becomes the hero of the Protestant Reformation. Sometimes the rejected messenger becomes the canonical prophet. Sometimes the crucified criminal becomes the savior of the world. Sometimes today's heretics become tomorrow's heroes. 
Because God often uses those on the outside to lead those on the inside. So if we don't want to miss what God is doing next, we have to listen to the voices from the margins. We don't have to accept everything that is said. But we have to at least ask ourselves, is this another example of God speaking to us from the fringes of our society? Because God has done it before, and he will do it again. So, if you, like me, are a part of the establishment, if you have influence in the church, if you have a voice that people normally listen to, then the challenge here is to stop talking once in a while so we can start listening. Start listening to the voices from the margins, the voices we are tempted to ignore, the voices we are tempted to reject, the voices that we are tempted to denounce as heretics, to listen to the anonymous young unmarried women to whom God has given a message. Because we need them. We need them to help us to see where God is leading us next. This is why Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes, Christians, especially ministers, that's hard to hear, especially ministers, so often think they must always contribute something when they are in the company of others. That is the one service they have to render. They forget that listening can be a greater service than speaking. Many people are looking for an ear that will listen. They do not find it among Christians because these Christians are talking where they should be listening. But he who can no longer listen to his brother will soon be no longer listening to God either. He will be doing nothing but prattle in the presence of God too. This is the beginning of the death of the spiritual life. And in the end, there is nothing left but spiritual chatter. If we want to listen to God, we have to seek out those voices on the margins and listen to them with empathy because they'll tell us where God is moving next. Second, if you find yourself on the margins of the Christian community with a message to share, then speak with courage and speak with kindness. If you belong to a socioeconomic class or a racial class or an ethnic class whose voice hasn't really been heard, if you, like these women, these anonymous women, are young or inexperienced or belong to a gender that has sometimes been disregarded, and God has given you a message, like he has placed a burden on your heart, he has shown you a brokenness in this community that needs to be fixed, an injustice that needs to be righted, if he has placed that burden on your heart, then speak with courage and speak with kindness. I say speak with courage because I know that talking to a community that may not want to hear what you have to say is incredibly hard. It's incredibly difficult. That's why most people don't. Most people stay silent and walk away. When faced with brokenness in the church of Christ, most people step away instead of leaning in. And I get it. Because stepping away allows you to avoid a lot of pain and heartache, difficult conversations. And sometimes you do have to step back for a moment for your own spiritual health. I get all that. But if you have the resilience and if you have the courage to step into that gap and speak prophetically, to act in ways that bring wholeness and completeness and rightness to what is wrong, then God can use your courage as a catalyst for healing. So speak with courage and speak with kindness. Because as difficult as it is for you to speak, it's also difficult for some of us to listen. Because honestly, 
we're more used to speaking than listening. So these conversations will require mercy and grace. But that's nothing new. Because God's justice has always been accompanied by his mercy. See, that's not the way that it works in our society. In our society, getting justice is often defined as getting even. Am I right? So when we see injustice, we want someone to pay. A perfect example of this is the now legendary story that Dave Hagler, a former umpire, wrote in the LA Times. He wrote about a time when he was speeding in Boulder, Colorado, and a police officer pulled him over. And he tried to get out of the ticket. He, he, he shared of how he was a safe driver. He normally doesn't speed, and he was worried about how this would affect his insurance. But the police officer was in no mood for mercy that day. So he told Dave, if you don't like the ticket, take it to the judge. Well, about three months later, Dave was umpiring behind home plate at an amateur baseball game when guess who stepped up to the plate to bat? <laughs> it was that same police officer. And he says that the police officer recognized him and he recognized the police officer. <laughs> and sort of sheepishly, the police officer asked, so how did that thing with the ticket go? To which Dave replied, swinging everything. We love stories like this because the person gets what they deserve, right? But that's not how God's justice works. God's justice is not just about retribution. It's also about redemption. Amen? It's not just about removing the knife. It's healing the wound. It's not just paying the debt. It's reconciling the relationship. So if we are working towards that kind of justice, God's kinds of justice, that means we need to also work together to make what is wrong right. This is not just us calling out what is wrong, just going on a rant on social media. No, this is us doing the hard work together to find ways to bring healing and wholeness. That's why God's justice requires God's mercy. Because justice without mercy is lopsided. It's all about retribution and not at all about redemption. It's all about revenge and not about reconciliation. That's why the prophet Micah wrote these famous words. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, yes, but also to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Because God's justice always requires God's mercy. So, if you find yourselves on the margins of God's community with a message to share, speak with courage, and speak with kindness. Speak and act in ways that will bring wholeness and healing. How many of you have ever been to a petrified forest before? Some of you, yeah. If you go to the Petrified National Forest in Arizona, you'll see the hills covered with what look like wooden logs. But when you get a little bit closer, you discover those that wood is actually turned into stone. They don't grow. They don't change. They remain untouched by time. And sometimes we like to think the teachings of Scripture are like that. Unchanging. Untouched. And yet, we serve a God who moves. Who moves us to a better understanding of him who moves us to become more and more like him. So what if we stop seeing those teachings as petrified wood 
and started to see them like living trees, which are rooted firmly in the past, but are constantly growing to the future. Maybe then we'd be more willing to listen to those voices on the margins. Maybe then we wouldn't miss out on what God is doing next. And maybe, just maybe then, we'd find a little of that changed adorkable. Let's pray. Our good and gracious God, we serve you who move, and yet we are so uncomfortable with change. You challenge us to grow and stretch our views of who you are and what you're doing in our lives. Lord, lead us, kicking and screaming. Help us to listen to the voices that you've sent us from the margins, is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.
Hello, good friends. So glad to be with you again. This is a very special week, as is every week, and a special list of greetings. But I have a surprise along the way. If you listen carefully, you'll hear about it. Hello, Ella Barrett, right in Loma Linda, five years old. Look at this darling little lady. And hello to Mommy Edna and Daddy Johnny and sister. Bronwyn Landless, Winchester, Virginia. Hello, Bronwyn, happy birthday. And there with Mr. Higgs and then with Sister Jill and your parents. Elaine Smith, Monterey, California. 98 years old, Elaine. Bless your heart. Here's the lovely lady herself. So good to see you, Elaine, and a very happy birthday. I remember the privilege of being with you in Kirkland, Washington. Nathan Yavor, Redlands, 12th birthday. Yes, I know I greeted him last week, but I didn't know about his baptism. And therefore, I have to greet you, dear Nathan. So proud of you. Jared Wareham, Yucaipa, California. Hello, Jared. Happy birthday. Look at him there at the top of Glacier National Park in Montana. Then with the pilot on their trip and with parents at Lake Louise as they mark their 50th anniversary. Yes, congratulations, Gerald and Dorothy. Your wedding day there and always warmest congratulations. Jack Clark, Apopka, Florida. 100th birthday. Now listen, folks, for the surprise. He has marked his 100th birthday today, and he and dear Jane, who is 98, marked their 75th anniversary, and Betsy and I get to be with them this very day. Hello, Jane Fearing, Fish, Ellensburg, Washington. Happy birthday, lady. There with husband Jonathan, and then with your children. Hello, Don Lowe, Conover, North Carolina. Happy birthday, young fella. And there with dear Mimi. Gwen Matthews Acampo, Loma Linda. Hello, Gwen. I call you cousin, you know. There with husband Sam. And then delightful experiences come out of your kitchen. Eduardo Ocampo, also Loma Linda, 93rd birthday. Congratulations, sir, there with wife Flora, and then with son Nino also. Carol Monette, Banning, California, and Loma Linda. Happy birthday to you, Carol, as I get to see you there with dear Don. Calvin Thompson, Colton, California. Always glad to be reminded of you, Calvin. Happy birthday, man. And there he is with dear wife Carolyn, and then their daughter, Julie. Hello, Mike Leno, Yucaipa, California, and on staff at Azure Hills, the pastor preacher himself, and singing with wife Starla. John Gilbertson, Tacoma Park, Maryland. Long time no see, John, but happy birthday nonetheless. Adam Lay, Riverside, California. Glad to be reminded of your birthday, Adam, and I'm here to wish you all the best, man. Ken Salerno, Jr., New Plymouth, Idaho. Birthday number 65, Ken. There with dear Vicki, your wife, my niece. And then with Vicki and daughter Fabri. And then with son Trace and grandson Drew. Debbie Clausen, College Dale, Tennessee. I think these days. Happy birthday, Debbie. And glad to see you with husband Ben. Carol and Don Brett, Yucaipa, 36th anniversary. I am here to join all your friends in wishing you a happy anniversary. Sonia DeLang, Redlands, California. Hello, Sonia. Always glad to be in touch with you and hear you. Happy birthday. And there with husband Mark. Marlon Delinsky, Yucaipa, California. Happy birthday to you, Marlon. So good to see you with dear Sharon. Ellen and Jim Clisby. Riverside, California, anniversary number 62, I think. There you were, and still joying cake, and what a delightful family. Leslie Lewis, Pastor Lewis, Charlotte, North Carolina. Happy birthday, Leslie, there with wife Carol, 
and then your beautiful family. Esla Hutchinson, Durham, Ontario, Canada. A very happy birthday to you, Lady Esla. And that goes for you also, Jaya Laughlin Hutchinson, there in Durham. A very happy birthday to you. Carl Hutchinson, Coburg, Ontario, Canada. And I wish you, sir, all the best as well. And that goes for you, Junior Carlisle Hutchinson, Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Happy birthday. Hello, Zara Bridgemohan Grant, Durham, Ontario, Canada. Happy birthday to you, lady. And to you as well, Nicole Guthrie, Markham, Ontario, Canada. So glad for all you friends who have connected with me through our mutual friend, Deanna Glenmeyer. Loma Linda, California. Hello, Deanna. Happy birthday to you. There with Heather Holdenar. Stephen Harden, Wenatchee, Washington. Hello, Stephen. Happy birthday to you, rugged man you are. And there with wife Ruby, Pam and Mike Tucker, Grand Prairie, Texas. Sixth anniversary, you two. I wish you all the very best. Glad to always see you and learn about your work. And John McGraw. Vinton, Virginia, 98th birthday. I just learned about your birthday, John, and so glad to greet you and have wonderful memories of our time together in Potomac Conference. Okay, one more time it is, and I look forward to next time.